May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. When was the last time you looked at yourself in a carnival mirror? You know, the distortions that we see that come from the physics of sight. We see a person in the light that she or he reflects back to us. Obviously, this process depends on our eye as well as the light coming from the other. For example, if you have astigmatism, your corneas are shaped differently so that your uncorrected vision is distorted. And some of us actually know all about this. There are all sorts of reasons for distorted images. The junior scientific information will end here, but might illumine the gospel today. As Jesus and his disciples are walking along the mountainous path up to the region called Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asks what they think of him. The question, who do you say that I am? Perhaps his question comes from his need to understand how they really feel about him. He might also be setting up a teaching in which he gets his students to struggle to express their own answer and then draws them into dialogue. Both of these possibilities deserve a little closer exploration. The first portrays Jesus as a vulnerable human being, seeking assurance from his friends. We've rarely given much attention to this idea that Jesus is desirous of our love, but in this incident, it seems to reveal that something unexpected about our relationship with God is about to happen. In our worship, we have calls to worship, we have invocations, we have blessings, we have intercessions, we have thanksgiving, we have praise. We have many ways to express our relationship with God, but rarely, although we did it a couple times today, do we talk just about love? How often in our prayers do we simply express our love? While we know that above all else, this is the most important thing, we don't always mention love when we articulate our prayers. We aren't saying, oh my God, I love you so much, or Jesus, I love you more than anyone. Thinking in human terms, as Jesus would have, we realize that humbled people often feel embarrassed or even put off by prayers of adulation or praise. It's okay to thank them or to ask forgiveness from them because all those contribute to living a growing relationship. But our most basic emotional need is love. Admiration can emphasize the differences between us. Think about the possibility that Jesus may have been revealing as a human and as a divine being, a desire for love when he asked the question, who do you say that I am? Another possibility is that Jesus is inviting the, woman, the women and men who walk with him to go into their own depths to explore what they really believe. To ask, what do you think of me, draws both the questioner and the question into vulnerability and intimacy. Seen in that light, Jesus' question may have been an invitation to grow in their relationship with him. When Peter responded, you are the Christ, he was speaking from his own perspective, his own point of view. He based his perception of Jesus on his own hopes and his own expectations for who Jesus was and who he would become. If we are to describe Peter's answer in terms of the above listed types of prayers, we might say he was blessing him or he was proclaiming his faith or he was expressing thanksgiving or praise. But he did not say, you are the one that we love. You are the one that we follow. Peter recognized the greatness before him, but his expectations distorted his perception of who Jesus was and was becoming. Peter's next response led Jesus to turn to him, to order him to get behind me, Satan. You are the follower in this situation, Jesus continues. Don't try to tempt me into being something that I am not. Saying that and warning the disciples about coming events reveals how deeply Jesus was rooted in the attitude described by Isaiah in today's first reading, the third song of the suffering servant, 
When Jesus exemplified what the servant said, the Lord opens my ear that I may hear, and I have not rebelled. You see, Jesus, is rooted, his, Jesus rooted his identity in his relationship with his father, and thus he was in line for all of the rejection that humanity directed at him and at God. Peter and the gang didn't want to understand this, even though Jesus said it at least three times. They imagined and preferred that he would be a warrior messiah, that he would be a weapon-wielding liberator who would vanquish all their enemies, wipe them out, overwhelm them with his strength and power. But like the carnival mirror, their vision was distorted. Their hearts were not seeing the light that Jesus reflected, but instead their own circus mirror image of who they wanted him to be. Jesus changes the view. He fills all of the roles they have in mind, just not the way they have it in mind. His example liberates others from fear. His example liberates others from every kind of fear. He reveals his victory, his strength, his power by demonstrating that no assault against the repu his reputation or even his life could make him turn back or walk away in shame. He took up his cross and through his sacrifice gave the victory. And I, I just need to say this, when Jesus says this, this is the last time you're gonna hear this from me, I promise. <laughs> you need to remember who this guy was. He was the son of a Nazarene carpenter, and he built the crosses that the Roman Empire crucified people in his village while he was growing up. Jesus built the crosses that circled the hillside of Nazareth, and thousands of people were crucified as he was growing up. So when Jesus says, take up your cross, he's not, it's not a metaphor, it's not a figure of speech, it's calling people to lift the cross and carry the burden of that cross just as he did throughout his life and particularly as a child growing up. He is seriously declaring that what we need to do is sacrifice for others. The way of the cross is truly to feel the love that Jesus extends to us with which he embraces us so fully that we would mirror to others not in a distorted carnival mirror kind of way, but in a clear way, like the mirror we look into each day. He wants us to see him love and see him express his love to others, and he wants us to do the same. The Gospels always aim to alter perceptions. So do the rest of Scripture, too. But discipleship in the Gospels carries no insurance policy Following Jesus is a risky proposition. It turns everything upside down and inside out and offers us the costly freedom to learn to love God as God is, all powerful and in love with life and always bringing beauty and creativity to life. Someone who carried the cross and sought mightily to reflect God's love was Jesus' younger brother, James. James was the second born to Mary, or as some people like to say, the first born to Joseph and Mary. He didn't follow Jesus throughout his ministry, but became a believer after he saw his brother rise from the dead. He later became the first bishop of Jerusalem. In his letter to the church, James digs into the importance of mirroring Christ, so much so that our words will always match our actions. He begins by honoring teachers, but reminds everyone that teaching is not for everyone, because teachers make a living with their tongues. The tongue speaks many words. The tongue can do great things, and it can do great harm. The tongue is small, as he says, like the rudder of a ship, but it guides, as the pilot uses it, it guides the soul and the body. It can direct or it can misdirect the body. Or a match, he says, can light a small fire for cooking or warming the home and the body. Or it can cause a blaze to rage throughout the land, especially in dangerous desert regions like they were all part of. Or, in our case, central Ohio in a drought. Watch out for what fire can do. The tongue is capable of blessing and cursing. It can belittle, it can mock, 
It can abuse, it can curse, it can intimidate, it can even wage war. And it can destroy everything and everyone in its path. Or it can heal, it can bring love, it can bring acceptance, it can bring new hope and new life. The tongue is a powerful little tool. And I would extend the tongue to social media today as well. Not just this one that we have in each of our mouths, but AI photos that take a picture from one place and weave a destructive story about another place and other people. Fits the description of a tongue out of control. We have seen this kind of abusiveness just 45 minutes away this week in Springfield, Ohio. Someone making things up and lying on social media has set a community and now a nation on fire and on its ear against the Haitian community in Springfield, but more than that, against immigrants and refugees everywhere. What starts as an unkind word against a neighbor has turned into a raging fire against all people who talk different and look different than you or me. And I might add that one Erica Lee, the woman who started this firestorm about Haitian immigrants stealing and eating people's pets, admitted this week to making things up. And she told NBC News, it just exploded into something I didn't even know could happen. Really, Erica? How often have we seen this happen? It happens in neighborhoods and schools, and it happens in churches, too. In James's words, this is why Erica Lee should never be a teacher. But, like it or not, Erica Lee is a teacher. And so are each one of us in our families and our communities. Like Erica, we are all teachers of our children and grandchildren, of our neighbors' children and grandchildren, of our church's children and grandchildren. Each of us is a teacher, and they're watching us all the time. So take a look in the mirror, and I don't mean a carnival mirror, just a regular one. What do you see? Do you see looking back at you a person who is joyful, speaks thoughtfully and kindly and reflect to others the best of who they are? Do you see love looking back, or do you see something else? Speaking with kindness matters. Carrying the cross matters. Loving one another matters. And as we love, and as we see Christ more clearly, we will learn to follow him, rather than the contorted illusions we see in our carnival mirrors. Amen.